¿Qué tal? Buenas tardes a todos. Eh, bienvenidos a la primera de tres conferencias sobre hidrógeno verde organizado por el Instituto de Materiales Avanzados para la Manufactura Sostenible. Eh, yo soy Oliva Probst y quiero presentarles al eh, conferenciante de hoy, el profesor eh, Thomas Klassen. Um, to do that, I will switch to English. Um, uh, Thomas Klassen is a professor um, for Let me just check. As a full professor at the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering at Helmut Schmidt University of the German Armed Forces in Hamburg, Germany. And he's also director at the Institute of Hydrogen Technology at the Helmut Center Herium at Gestad. The Hamburg is supervising 45 scientists and engineers as well as seven technicians. Professor Kleissen's research concentrates on functional materials for hydrogen technology and kinetic spraying as innovative technology for functional coatings and additive manufacturing. At the research center Herium, uh, his research focus lies on hydrogen technology, uh, specifically functional materials for solar water splitting and metal hydrate storage. At the University of the Armed Forces, um, his team and himself uh, work on novel deposition technology for photoactive coatings, additive manufacturing and repair. In his research, Professor Kleisen and his collaborators try to span the full range from basic science to applications. Accordingly, their activities aim for a comprehensive understanding of fundamental mechanisms, the development of suitable process technology and the systematic development of novel parts and products with tailored properties for implementation of new technologies together with industry. So um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Klassen with his talk on hydrogen and materials and components for hydrogen uh, technology. So uh, Professor Klassen, it's our pleasure. Thank you very much, Professor Probst, for this opportunity to speak today. Buenas tardes to everybody and welcome to my presentation. Um, the kind introduction has already mentioned uh, the uh, title of my talk, which will be um, Hydrogen Generation and Storage from Materials to Components. Let me just shortly... Okay. So, um, as already mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm actually at two affiliations, uh, University, Helmut Schmidt University, and also a National Research Center, Helmut Center in Herion. And um, the topic today is about sustainability of our energy systems. And um, I would like to start with acknowledging um, the team. It's actually always um, a team effort and team work that I'm presenting today. And um, we also have a um, great network uh, together with Berkeley Labs, Helmholtz Center in Berlin, um, AIST in Japan, um, Dartmouth College in the US, and um, also local network with uh, Fraunhofer University and also DLR. So um, all of this uh, somehow contributes to the output and to the results. So let me start with um, the actual problem. Um, you are aware that uh, we are in a phase where climate change is becoming more prominent. And um, I have here two images, uh, two diagrams um, for two different scenarios. This is uh, with a certain solar input and um, less than two degrees C uh, global warming. And the right one is uh, higher solar input and um, higher solar input, um, higher carbon dioxide. And um, this uh, is a scenario of um, more than six degrees plus. So um, the interesting fact here is that um, there's nothing in between. So um, either we manage to stay below two degrees C or we uh, inevitably end up um, at plus six degrees. And you can also see on this graph that uh, the temperature increase is not homogeneous. So uh, in average, it would be plus six, but um, on land, it's much more than on sea. And um, there's actually much more warming um, on the North Pole than there is at the equatorial region. So, um, This has uh, some implications and uh, Germany and Mexico are well connected uh, by the Gulf Stream. You bring us 
uh, with the Gulf Stream, uh, the warmth of Mexico to Germany. Otherwise, uh, we would be much colder. But um, it has already been found that the Gulf Stream uh, weakens and um, that there's 15% less heat transport. And um, this uh, would um, continue and uh, would bring us um, less heat to Germany. It will get colder, but uh, you would um, lose less heat in Mexico. So it would be even hotter in Mexico. So um, here another image, if all uh, the ice would melt on Earth, this is how it would look like and how the coastlines would develop. We would see um, 68 uh, meters of sea level rise. And um, Cancun would be gone, basically, but um, Nuevo uh, Leon would uh, probably have a harbor to, um, to uh, go to sea. Hamburg uh, would be gone then, too. In Europe, uh, a lot of Northern Europe would be lost. Okay, so um, this is why uh, there's um, the Paris Agreement for Climate um, uh, Protection. And um, this is uh, the net CO2 emissions as we see it now. And um, the Paris Agreement actually is the purple line here. So uh, we are supposed to halve our CO2 emissions by 2030 and um, go to net zero 2050. And you see, we even go below um, the zero line then. That means we withdraw uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. And this is already uh, requested by the climate researchers um, at 2030. We should begin to... Uh, reduce the CO2 um, content in our atmosphere to uh, reduce um, um, respective forcing. So um, if we take a closer look at uh, the energy consumption in Mexico here on this side and in Germany and um, what our uh, fuels currently are, um, you can see that most of it in both countries is still fossil fuels, and um, we have to uh, increase our efforts to uh, the renewables. And especially in Mexico, of course, there's a big potential for solar energy harvesting. In Germany, uh, we installed a lot of wind power. Meanwhile, solar, the sun doesn't shine uh, so nicely as in Mexico, so it's less efficient. Yeah, so this was also uh, the reason to set up um, a German-Mexican energy partnership. And um, the aim is actually uh, what you see here, that um, Germany um, imports energy from Mexico. So um, here you have very good conditions for uh, providing uh, green energy and produce green hydrogen. And Germany definitely will be an energy importing country. We don't have enough resources to produce our own energy. There's not enough um, space actually to do that. And um, also our trade balance will be uh, really out of tune if uh, we would try to do it ourselves. So um, we will definitely rely on imports and a uh, potential partner for this could be Mexico. So um, you can see here, this is uh, the price for hydrogen production. And um, in Mexico, the price is rather low, um, between one and two euros per kilogram of hydrogen. While uh, in Germany, it's uh, rather high. That also means we pay a lot. We would pay like four or five euros per kilogram. So this is um, a good business proposal to actually install renewable energy um, where the sun shines most, like in Mexico, and transport the energy to Germany. So it's not yet clear um, how we will import the energy. What is clear, definitely, it will be hydrogen. We will import hydrogen. But the type of molecule that hydrogen is bond to um, is still open. So it may be just uh, liquefaction, um, liquid hydrogen that's transported in big ships and big vessels at uh, cryogenic temperatures. 
So uh, that would be a 20 Kelvin, so uh, very cold. Um, the alternative here is um, ammonia and H3. Then uh, the temperatures are more moderate, so it's easier to do. However, you need, of course, um, ways to produce NH3 from hydrogen and also to, um, to release the hydrogen then in Germany again. So this can only be done at industrial plants and requires uh, some additional energy. So uh, liquid hydrogen has about 48% uh, round trip efficiency for ammonia. It would be 46, so slightly less. Even less would be LOHC or hydrocarbons, but um, there is a perspective that those uh, would also uh, be um, potentially good for transporting hydrogen. LOHC stands for liquid organic hydrogen carrier. Uh, so basically it's some kind of oil that's uh, liquid and um, stores um, hydrogen. Okay, so... Um, here you see the volumetric and gravimetric energy of the different um, ways to transport. And you can see you have to go to high compression or to liquid hydrogen to actually um, transport enough energy uh, per volume. Um, NH3 is even a little bit higher than liquid hydrogen uh, regarding the volume. Okay, so um, we have uh, had a, pro a project actually with um, Airbus to uh, evaluate which would be the cheapest option to transport um, hydrogen to Germany. And um, the outcome is here. This is a result. So that's basically the hydrogen supply costs, what uh, Germany would have to pay or Airbus in this case for flying. And um, here are the different uh, scenarios um, for different kind of frameworks. And uh, I don't want to go into too much detail. Um, just point out here that um, it's cheaper to uh, go liquid in Germany um, than any other option for um, and come in with a ship, actually than any other option like pipelines or um, production um, of uh, LOHC or NH3. So um, liquid hydrogen is the most favorable. And uh, GER means uh, that we produce it in Germany, that we liquidify it in Germany. And um, it's even cheaper if that is done in another country where uh, there's more green energy available, like Mexico. Um, then the price would be lowest. So um, here's uh, the hydrogen perspective for Nuevo uh, Leon. So um, you can see actually there are several regions where it's worthwhile um, installing uh, renewable energy production, um, solar and wind actually. And um, these are the areas, uh, the red ones, where most of the energy could be produced here. Um, but there's also some options in other areas. Uh, this already includes that there are some challenges involved with this. So, um, of course, the, one of the challenges is to ramp up solar panel installation. You need space for that. And um, you need uh, solar uh, energy also for your own some domestic supply. And in addition, um, now the business uh, project would be to use it to export energy. And that also requires uh, water, of course, that you can split to produce hydrogen from. And um, we have to think responsibly uh, regarding the use of water resources. Um, Potentially, this uh, also requires that uh, wastewater is uh, treated and used uh, to use it for uh, water splitting. And we also have to think about uh, desalination, which would, of course, require some additional energy. But um, this is included here, and this is the reason why here um, and uh, in the north of Nuevo Leon, uh, the production of hydrogen would be most uh, promising because uh, there are some water bodies uh, that can be used um, without uh, jeopardizing drinking water availability. 
Okay, so this was just as an introduction how the political situation is like. And um, now I will switch uh, gears to um, the scientific um, part of my talk. So I will start with uh, green hydrogen production by solar assisted water splitting. This is a so-called um, artificial leaf that um, enables uh, us to um, use a cell, one cell that combines uh, photovoltaic and um, electrolyzes in one device. So um, how does it work? You can see that here, that's just a schematic of the artificial leaf. You have two different materials, cathode and anode. And actually the cathode would like to draw electrons from the anode, but uh, the anode is a semiconductor and um, there are no free electrons. So uh, what we do now is uh, we irradiate here uh, the photo anode. It generates um, uh, electrons, mobile electrons, and um, the electrons are withdrawn. And um, so there's a lack of electrons and they, they are refilled by the bonding electrons of a water molecule. So uh, then the water is split into oxygen and hydrogen and the oxygen takes uh, everything uh, it needs. So it's neutral and um, the hydrogen is left as a proton because the electrons are gone and there's some uh, deficiency in electrons. So uh, the protons then have to move through the electrolyte to the other side, pick up the electrons here again, and then uh, you receive hydrogen on the other side. So um, the most interesting um, part of this uh, photoelectrochemical cell is actually the photoanode and the material that enables uh, this water splitting reaction and has a large enough band gap to provide the energy for water splitting. So um, the second uh, point is we have to uh, have nice coatings uh, that are able to um, actually uh, make the reaction chemically on the surface that is to absorb um, sunlight, but they also have to have enough um, electron mobility and have to be able to transport um, the electrons to the other electrode. So uh, we have a special method, kinetic spraying, that um, we uh, set up at um, Helmut Schmidt University to produce these coatings. You cannot see very much here, but um, I can tell you that uh, this is um, a nozzle where a gas is accelerated and um, powder particles, nanoparticles are fed into the gas stream. And um, those particles impact on this uh, substrate here and um, adhere to the substrate without any binder. So um, this is uh, actually the advantage of uh, kinetic spraying. You just use the kinetic energy to uh, deposit and bond particles to a substrate. And you don't need to um, have any organic binder, which would then be a, a disadvantage for transporting the electrons. So um, here we produce really good interfaces between our semiconductor and the back electrode that's supposed to uh, withdraw the electrons and um, that reduces the overall inner resistance of the cell and gives us high photocurrents. So I will show that um, here on this uh, view graph. This is like an overview. So um, we let particles impact and they deform and rebond. So this is uh, the mechanism how we form uh, coatings. This is out of a simulation. And this is actually how the coating looks like. The coating is only in this area, in this case, uh, bismuth vanadate, um, which is a very good uh, photo absorber and has uh, the right band gap. And this is um, on a substrate of FTO. That's the lower part and um, on glass. So we can either shine light from the top or shine light from the bottom to make the reaction. So if we come from the top, we um, do the water splitting here. 
and the electrons have to diffuse to the FTO layer and are transported to the other electrode. If we come uh, from the bottom, um, then uh, we generate and pick up um, the uh, um, electrons right at the lower interface of the bismuth vanadate layer. So the electron transport is not uh, any problem anymore, but um, the electron deficient holes have to diffuse to the surface. So um, conductivity of holes and um, electrons is different. And for some of uh, these materials, it's actually better to shine the light from the button. Okay, so once we have uh, the layer, we produce um, finally here devices where we test our uh, materials and our coatings. And because you see they are very rough, we also do some reference uh, specimen with well-defined surface roughness. So we can actually see what influence the roughness does and um, what is due to uh, the better conductivity at the interface and our special materials that we have chosen here as photoconductor. And we do then uh, light absorption, both uh, in experiment as well as in simulations to see where the light is absorbed. And um, I will go through the simulation and special measurement um, methods in the following slides. So um, here you see different bismuth vanadate um, in different thickness. Um, this is actually always the coating on FTO and on the glass substrate, as you have seen before. And we can produce uh, larger specimens. So this is about 10 centimeters, uh, 10 by 10 centimeter coatings that we can um, put in the devices. So here you see an example. And um, here you see what current density we get for different potentials. So this is basically the curve of merit. So what we um, can achieve in hydrogen production. Um, and you see the black line here is basically uh, if you don't shine any light on the surface, you don't get any photocurrent. As soon as uh, light hits the surface and is absorbed, uh, we get photocurrent and the photocurrent is directly proportional to production of hydrogen. And um, this is what we achieved with uh, just one um, material, bismuth vanadate, one layer by aerosol kinetic spraying, which is um, not a bad value. Um, it's uh, almost um, what you would get as an efficiency if you would have separate uh, photovoltaic and electrolyzer cells. So um, we took a look at uh, the surface structure, different um, surface uh, structural heights, as you can see here. And um, you see here the edge depth against the photocurrent. And um, we can say that a little bit is good. A little bit roughness increases your photocurrent and your efficiency, you absorb more light. But if you go uh, larger than this, um, then it doesn't help you very much because uh, the charge carriers have to travel all the way along these uh, structures. And that decreases the photocurrent again um, and increases um, the inner resistance. This is the reason. And if you do the simulation, you recognize that a lot of light is already absorbed at the tips here. And there's not much light penetrating uh, into the depth of these structures. So um, this is why uh, we um, can say with a certain roughness, you get better results. But um, the um, good results that we have cannot be all due to uh, the surface roughness. So here you see um, a special method. Um, it's quite complicated surface photovoltage measurement. So you have a laser that's um, irradiating your surface and um, you probe the reaction some uh, fractions of a second afterwards to see uh, whether your charge carriers are mobile or stick to the surface. Um, it's a very uh, small device actually, self-made, uh, but um, it's uh, quite effective in telling you what's going on. And here we have uh, bismuth vanadate together with uh, tungsten oxide 
on the FTO and um, we can see the differences that we get if we increase tungsten oxide and um, if we illuminate from the back side or from the front side of the coating. And um, yeah, this color code is, uh, these diagrams are difficult uh, to interpret at, for, at uh, first glance, but I can tell you that um, there are certain features uh, that help us understand what's going on in the specimen and which screw we have to turn to improve um, our coatings even further. So, for example, we can uh, say that the stronger charge separation for backside illumination um, helps us, gives a shorter distance for electrons to reach the back contact and um, gives uh, the um, kinetics a better chance and uh, reduces the losses because in bismuth vanadate uh, electrons have um, smaller mobility as compared to positive holes and um, therefore back illumination for this material is better. But this is just uh, one conclusion. So this is more intuitive and more easier to understand atomic force microscopy and photocurrent analysis with a nanometer um, resolution. So we can um, have a look at the de deposited uh, titanium dioxide or um, any other uh, photocurrent, uh, photoactive material. And uh, we basically get here a height profile in AFM. That's the usual imaging mode and it tells you um, how rough your uh, surface is. But we can do something more. We can also let a current run through the AFM tip and um, see where uh, we generate electrons at the surface, charges at the surface, and uh, where our active centers are. So here you see this is in dark mode. There's not much contrast. If we illuminate uh, by a laser, um, which is tunable, then uh, we can see the dark areas give us a lot of potential. So here, a lot of different, a lot of charge carriers are produced while in the bright areas, almost no charge carriers are present. So um, we can directly correlate um, with a height profile, uh, which areas of the specimen are good and which are bad. And, and taking a closer look, uh, we can tell that the amorphous regions, these are amorphous regions in our coatings, don't do a good job in uh, photocatalysis and photoelectrochemistry but the crystalline areas are much uh, more effective and there are even certain crystalline uh, orientations that give us uh, more photocurrents. Okay, so finally uh, for this, um, let me just show you our recent, uh, re most recent results. We have been able to achieve 5.3 milliamps per square centimeter as photocurrent for um, co-deposited um, tungsten oxide and bismuth vanadate. Um, so this is a tandem cell, so, so to speak, and it helps to uh, draw the electrons by uh, bent bending towards uh, tungsten oxide. So um, in this way, we were able to achieve a rather high photocurrent, which is, uh, I think, uh, better than um, pure photovoltaics and um, uh, separate electrolyzers. So the technology basically gives you a high cell efficiency and it's scalable and um, the deposition method is also a low cost method. So um, I would then uh, go to uh, another example of materials research from materials to devices. Um, this is hydrogen storage in both mobile and stationary applications. So um, here is some comparison of energy uh, that um, you can put in your car for um, about 500 kilometers range. So this would be our regular fossil fuel diesel. Um, and we can never uh, achieve something this small and uh, at the same time be efficient. So in comparison, you see here the battery for the same range um, 
the system weight would be 830 kilograms. The actual active material inside is 450, uh, 540 kilograms. The volume is also quite large. And in between here is hydrogen. So hydrogen seems to be a very good solution um, for mobility also if uh, you um, would like to have a certain range. And you can see six kilograms are enough for 500 kilometers range. And the complete system would uh, be uh, 125 kilograms heavy. And the volume is somewhere in between. So we are doing better than with batteries um, if uh, we want to store a certain amount of energy, um, like for 500 kilometers range in the car. So this is for compressed hydrogen. And um, now I would like to introduce how you can store hydrogen actually. So hydrogen is molecular at room temperature and um, the molecules don't like each other very much. So they have a long distance um, between each other. And that gives you a very low energy density of only 0.09 grams of hydrogen per liter. If you compress that, sorry, that was my fault. So if you compress that, to uh, 350 bars, you can bring the molecules closer together. You reach already 31 grams of hydrogen per liter. However, you have to spend some energy for compression. So the efficiency is 91% then. You lose 9% of the energy for compression. You can double the pressure to 700 bars, press it even further, get up to 60 grams of hydrogen per liter, and um, you spend about 17 percent of the energy content. Or you can liquidify hydrogen, then uh, that's uh, physically the highest density here. Um, with um, cooling down, you lose about 33 uh, percent of your energy. And um, what we actually propose here is to use metal hydrides. That is, we split the hydrogen molecule and the hydrogen then diffuses into the interstitial sites of metal and um, forms a chemical bond to the metal. So then you can even store double as much. That's very impressive. So your container is already full of metal, but you can store more than it would be empty and you would have it in liquid form. So uh, this is, um, I think, uh, what um, has a good perspective and you only lose very slight amount of energy. The reason is basic thermodynamics. So the state of the system uh, is determined by the chemistry delta H, the enthalpy, and uh, the entropy. So that's uh, like uh, the measurement for this order. So, and with the temperature, you can uh, tune which has more influence. So the chemistry says, Let's form a metal hydride, so uh, hydrogen is bond and stored. The entropy says, no, 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 it's much uh, better to have a hydrogen gas because the gas has much more entropy. And um, so we separate again. And at low temperature, um, the chemistry will win, hydrogen is stored. At high temperature, the entropy will win, and hydrogen is released. So it's fully, trans uh, fully reversible. And um, the 7% loss are actually the bonding heat. And if you can uh, use some waste heat, um, like from a fuel cell, you can uh, even get better in your overall efficiency. So hydrogen and metal hydrides has certain advantages. It has a very high energy density by volume. It has a very high efficiency and it has a high safety because if you don't provide uh, the heat to the tank, no hydrogen is released. So it will never be uh, catastrophically released into the environment. So what we do as an overview, again, we start from fundamental materials design. We um, mix different uh, powders together. Uh, we do thermodynamic uh, calculations and estimations how our reaction enthalpy will turn out. Then uh, we produce it also on a larger scale. We put it in a tank and um, take a look at uh, the heat transfer, 
which is uh, then rate limiting, we um, come up with uh, certain tank designs and then uh, we integrate it into a complete system with a fuel cell and um, see how it performs. <clears throat> So um, first, what would, do we do in uh, materials? Here you can see the reversible hydrogen capacity by weight. So this is the major disadvantage of metal hydrides, of course. Um, if your tank is already full of metals, then um, you, uh, you um, have a lot of weight that you need to carry. So you want to get uh, to light metals and um, you realize if you go to light metals, they love hydrogen so much that you need to go to higher temperatures to be able to get it out again. And um, our uh, efforts here were to um, reduce the temperatures and we were success successful with uh, this concept. We combine two metal hydrides and offer partner exchange. So um, the metal atoms react with each other to form um, an intermetallic compound, and that releases heat and helps to uh, supply the temperature for hydrogen release. So because uh, we now have two materials diffusing, kinetics are a little bit difficult. So what we did is we encapsulated the metal hydrides into a polymer shell that's transparent for hydrogen, and in this way, kept the reactants together. So uh, the reversibility is good and um, kinetics also uh, stay um, in a good range. So um, we then uh, take all those data that we achieve on the material, transfer it to um, a metal hydride tank and have a look as how the heat is um, distributed in the tank, the reaction heat, and how we can um, get it out again. And for that, uh, we also have a cooperation with um, nuclear reactor facility for neutron scattering, and we can see how uh, the density of the material is, where the material, um, where the hydrogen goes, um, how, uh, what kind of temperature development we have. And if we fold, fold all of this together, we get to uh, the sweet spot of how we should design our tank to be fast and efficient and um, store and release hydrogen. So uh, we built the tanks, we integrate it into systems. And um, this, you can't recognize it, but it's actually a, uh, an Audi Q7. So uh, this is um, the test bench for that. And it performs like an Audi Q7, although it doesn't move. OK, so we uh, put it into systems. We have uh, done some smaller cars. I stand behind because I wouldn't fit in. This was uh, one of the record cars that um, achieves 6,000 miles per gallon. I wanted to have a car where I can sit in. It doesn't go as fast. As, it doesn't go as far but um, it fits me in the case of beer in the trunk, that were the conditions. And um, then we uh, had a cooperation with Audi to put it into a car and we were actually doing better than batteries. And maybe we will see it one day in one of the bigger cars. So um, we also calculate the cost and just shortly uh, we come up uh, with the metal hydrides with about the same price that you would have for refueling with uh, regular fossil fuels. And um, so I think uh, this is a um, good perspective uh, for zero emission uh, mobility. Good, just uh, also shortly to mention finally here um, where we uh, stand and which projects we currently uh, investigate. We have uh, green hydrogen generation with uh, photoelectrochemical cells. Um, there's a um, larger effort. Then zero emission vehicles, uh, hydrogen storage for fuel cell vehicles, what I just mentioned. We are also involved in clean ships. Um, Herion is, uh, will get a new research vessel for climate research and coastal research. And this will uh, be able to run two hours on hydrogen only. Um, and uh, it will contain one of our metal hydride tanks. 
For green aviation, we uh, design a roadmap together with Airbus uh, for the refueling infrastructure also. They want to fly 2028, and the first passenger flights are uh, scheduled for 2035. Green energy on demand. So uh, we have uh, larger projects for sector coupling, power, heat, and mobility, and for designing refueling stations. And we are involved in a larger climate effort in Germany where we try to uh, try to advise what is possible with um, metal hydrides and with hydrogen and um, where uh, we could what we could reach within the next decade. So this is just an example. One of our industrial partners, uh, this is um, a regular 40 foot container and it contains um, up to 260 kilograms of hydrogen in form of metal hydride. So um, what do I see uh, as potential partnerships for hydrogen technology uh, with industry in Mexico? So uh, of course there's oil industry. They um, like Pemex um, are stuck to uh, the regular fossil fuels, but um, they reconsider because they know their business model will cease and they will um, have to change. And um, actually BP, Shell, ExxonMobil, they are also active in Mexico and they are investing a lot in green technologies. And I could uh, see some cooperation with them in uh, water splitting in electrochemical cells and also producing e-fuels by electrochemical reactions of hydrogen with uh, CO2. Then, um, of course, in Mexico, you have a lot of car industry, Volkswagen, Bosch. I know my brother has been there several times. He works for Bosch, GM, Ford, Toyota. So um, there are a lot of car manufacturers that um, would like to go to zero emission mobility based on hydrogen. And um, we could provide um, the novel, efficient and safe hydrogen storage. Within uh, Monterey Tech, I think uh, there's um, a very strong engineering and science division uh, with um, activities on energy conversion, storage and management, decarbonization, climate change and circular economy, and also science and technology of water. And I could also see some links to uh, nanofabrication, um, which is also an activity in uh, your faculty. But, um, this all has to be linked to uh, also public acceptance and it has to be uh, affordable. So I can also see some links and a joint cooperation with the other faculties in hydrogen and hydrogen policy. So um, everything has to be uh, based, of course, on technical challenges, but you have to uh, teach and um, disseminate the knowledge and uh, you have to um, you have to get public acceptance for new technologies and it all has to be economically viable and you have to have the laws and regulation in place to make it real. So this all to save this precious marble in space um, all together and I think it has to be a global worldwide effort and um, this is also why I'm very interested in international cooperation in this field. Muchas gracias for your kind attention. Thank you very much for listening to me and spending your time. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Klassen. This was a very interesting uh, talk uh, going from the from the uh, overall political requirements and environmental requirements uh, through the materials and the components and finally pointing to the solutions. And uh, it was certainly very encouraging to see um, that uh, um, hydrogen storage and metal hydrides is uh, something, thanks certainly to your contributions and those of your group, um, uh, getting to the verge of technology. Uh, and that's uh, because, uh, well, but when I was in, studying physics uh, back some three decades back i was i remember the hydro um, metal hydrides are already around but it seems there has apparently there has been a quantum loop really in, in technology so this is very uh, encouraging to see 
so far, we don't have any uh, questions yet. I would like to encourage the audience to please um, state their questions in, in the chat. But I, I will go ahead uh, and uh, break the ice, so to speak, and start with uh, with a few questions. Um, uh, here's one. You you said you you conducted a study on the uh, viable technology technological options for hydrogen storage and transport, and um, it's somewhat surprisingly your um, your conclusion was that liquid hydrogen uh, was the best option for Germany, and even with locally produced uh, hydrogen, not even bringing it from higher resource. Um, generally, the understanding or kind of the dogma is that uh, uh, that ammonia is the way to go, huh? and you actually pointed to the much higher uh, density of uh, volum volumetric density of ammonia. Uh, is there a, a physical reason or technological reason where you can pinpoint uh, why why ammonia uh, why liquid hydrogen works better for Germany? Yes, so um, this uh, is all uh, depending, of course, on uh, the price for green energy you spend somewhere, and um, for the uh, overall efficiency of the method. So for liquid hydrogen, you um, have a slightly better overall efficiency, and in particular for um, for Airbus, in this case, it was very important to end with liquid hydrogen. So this was uh, maybe also the reason why liquid hydrogen turns out better here, because uh, if you transport it by ammonia and you use ammonia, like in steel production or for fertilizer, then ammonia is a better solution. And um, for Airbus, it was liquid hydrogen. They will definitely fly with uh, liquid hydrogen on board, so they would have to use the ammonia and uh, produce, liquidify it in Germany uh, with uh, the higher energy costs we have in Germany to uh, get to a liquid state. And this is why um, ammonia in the case of Airbus was not a good solution. It may be different, as I said, if you are in another sector and you can use the ammonia directly or you um, you are fine with gaseous um, hydrogen. I think then ammonia um, may still be a very good option. But in the case of um, Airbus, it had to be liquid hydrogen and liquefaction on site in Germany is very energy intensive and costly and this is why it was better to transport it in liquid form yeah okay yeah i, I think I, I, we we got this this was really the specific context and i think this it has become very clear it seems there were there are some questions pouring in we have one from luis uh, pedrero i suppose um well, he, uh, well, he's stating that he would like to collaborate with you um, producing green ammonia. I'm not sure if there's a question embedded somewhere. Um, so please uh, give it a try, Luis. Uh, maybe you want to pose a question. Uh, Rowen asks uh, if you can control the crystallinity of the materials deposited by the spray technology. Yes, yeah, so uh, this is a very good question. And actually, we can not really do that. So uh, we just spray particles at random. Um, they impact on the surface. And it uh, depends um, a little bit on um, the special uh, arrangement of uh, the crystal lattice and the orientation, whether they deposit and stick or they don't deposit. So you need some... Um, some uh, dislocation activation even in the ceramic materials at that uh, under these conditions that are close to 45 degrees. Then you get some, uh, some shearing in your ceramic particles, at least that's uh, the current view of the mechanisms, and you get some uh, fracture and fusion. So um, you basically form uh, open uh, radicals and they bond again and uh, bond to your substrate. And um, usually uh, this gives you some preferred orientation. But yeah, we cannot really determine and uh, predetermine or control uh, the orientation. So, yeah, well, you were referring to um, orientation. The question said a crystallinity, actually. So the amount of uh, crystal uh, versus amor uh, amorphous 
so what, okay. what I get from your for explanation that is the nanoparticles inherit the inherit the crystal structure uh, because they kind of regrow onto the surface. Is that what you're saying? Right. Oh, and um, yeah, crystallinity. Um, we have uh, we have some coatings that are very high in defects after deposition. So uh, we also experiment with different annealing procedures to uh, heal out some defects while still keeping uh, the nice microstructure. So. Mm -hmm. There's some um, parameter window uh, that's promising. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure if there are any other questions, um, but maybe uh, maybe you were explained um, very clearly that obviously the um, the weight of the crystal lattice or well the, the solid lattice where you're embedding your hydrogen into is obviously uh, an offset you you start with. Um, so that's why it's important to start with. Um, with light metals, uh, but you went through it pretty quickly. Can you briefly review, because I got the uh, thermodynamic part of uh, this uh, temporary alloy that was forming there, uh, but I don't re quite remember what the uh, metals were you're actually using. Huh? Yes, so um, I can go back to this one and share with you again. So this is uh, this is the slide you were talking about, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so um, what we uh, experiment with is uh, light uh, metals. I hope I can get the laser pointer again. Okay, so, oops, that was, where is it? Yeah, okay. So yeah, there are some uh, metal hydrides um, that are known for a long time, like for three decades, as you uh, said already. So uh, like iron titanium. Um, iron titanium um, absorbs hydrogen easily and releases it again at room temperature. However, because iron is quite heavy, as a high density, um, the weight related capacity is only 1.9%, so very low. Then, um, you go to uh, some other light metals like magnesium. Magnesium is a good candidate. Uh, magnesium can store a lot of hydrogen, 7.6% uh, uh, by weight, and um, also ha has a high density for um, volumetric energy density. However, um, the reaction enthalpy of um, magnesium and hydrogen is much higher. So um, you only uh, compensate um, for the enthalpy of bonding in this equation at a temperature of 300 degrees C. So um, this makes it um, okay if you compare it, if you combine it with a solid oxide fuel cell, but for um, a polymer fuel cell working at 80 degrees C, it's uh, not feasible. So then we uh, began to investigate different alloys. And yes, you can reduce um, the heat of bonding However, you also reduce uh, the weight-related capacity. So um, it almost seemed like um, there's nothing you can do uh, to um, escape this. There were some um, hydrides like lithium borohydride with um, almost, if you uh, take all the hydrogen out, uh, you would get to um, 19 weight percent, very high. But usually you are left with uh, lithium hydride um, and you can't split that. And um, this is why here it's at 13.5, uh, but you have to go at to 400 degrees to get it out. And um, it's not reversible. So this is why it's in brackets because it forms some uh, structures uh, that don't um, uh, form the lithium boron bond later again. So the boron six cage is quite uh, stable. So our idea then was, and um, this was about 2004, to combine two hydrides like magnesium hydride, lithium borohydride. And then um, you uh, have part of the one hydride, uh, the boron of the lithium borohydride reacting with the magnesium of the magnesium hydride and you form magnesium diborite, which is also a very stable compound. And this uh, 
gives you some additional heat or it reduces the overall reaction enthalpy to release hydrogen. So this is why you end up um, in the capacity somewhere between the two hydrides, but at much lower temperature. And this concept um, has been proven also for others like uh, here for potassium and um, for sodium. And um, the most recent is actually here. Um, that's a reactive hydride composite involving um, amides, lithium and magnesium amides. And um, this gives you a thermodynamic temperature of um, 30 degrees C comparable to iron titanium. However, the problem is now you have a reaction of metallic atoms with each other. Diffusion is much more difficult. So uh, while thermodynamically it's perfect, kinetically it doesn't start uh, before 95 degrees C. And this is why in the next step, we uh, try to bring the reactants closer together by encapsulating. And that helps us to promote the reaction. However, temperature is still very sluggish at uh, 90, 95 degrees C. Okay, yeah, so that was a long much. answer to a short question. No, no, it was, uh, I mean, you, um, and yeah, nice. I think there is a final question. Maybe we're one minute uh, before the end. So maybe, uh, Luis, um, I, I will read that out. I'm not sure if you can read that. So we'll, I'll read it out. Luis Pedro says, that the, in the case of the magnesium hydrides, we experience it, experience that the Fraunhofer Institute after several cycles and heat, there are cracks on the hydrides. These problems have been solved, hadn't been solved yet. Yes. Do you have a new approach? Uh, yes. So um, it's completely right. Um, although uh, the hydrogen atoms fit into the lattice, um, it breathes. So it swells uh, when you store hydrogen and it shrinks when you release hydrogen. And definitely, you will always form cracks. And it's a matter of how you design uh, your compact and to what degree you compact your powder, um, whether you finally have a stable structure or whether everything decrepitates in your tank as fine particles on the bottom. So uh, this is also um, some kind of um, experience and knowledge as to how you compact it and what uh, compaction agents you mix in to have a stable structure, even though you will have the cracking. Well, thank you very much. A uh, very interesting talk. And uh, I'm sure some of our materials experts and certainly Luis Pedrero has been active, uh, active uh, asking. Uh, will like would like to follow up on this conversation um, for the time being I would like to thank everybody for joining us and uh, I'm 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 confident that we'll be have, ha having a um, follow-up conversation so I know it's already late in, in Germany uh, Professor Klassen thank you very much for taking your time to be on the air uh, this hour of the day and uh, I guess we'll thank be in you touch. very much for having me thank you very much thank you very much for having me and have a nice day uh, thank you Bye-bye.